Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our second fireside talk, fireside chat, that is, with Rich Walker. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, so just a quick introduction. Just a quick introduction. Uh, Rich Walker is the co-founder and currently the managing director, correct me if I'm wrong, of Shadow Robot. And Shadow, uh, Shadow Robot makes probably the most dexterous robotic hands on the market. You may, seen, may have seen their collaboration with OpenAI for uh, uh, manipulation of 3D objects. Um, you may have seen them online and seen some of their work. So Rich is here to give us a little bit of insight into that kind of, uh, kind of work. Thanks for joining us, Rich. Oh, thank you. So yeah, I'm gonna uh, talk for a few minutes and hopefully talk, take you through a few things that might be interesting, relevant or helpful. And then looking forward to some, some Q and A and some discussion. Because uh, I guess what we're doing or what we have done as a company is unusual. As far as I understand it, most startup stories consist of two or three people sitting around, having an idea, seeing a business opportunity, raising some money off uh, angel investors, early stage investors, going and kind of growing a business of some sort. And then at some stage, um, selling it out and retiring or going off and becoming investors in the next round of companies. And that's not really what we did. Uh, our journey starts with a, a guy who decided, he's a photographer, his name is Richard Greenhill, and he was really interested in what could be done with home comp with computers. He, he acquired this interest because, and I, this is just like secret origin stories, I'm not sure we're the most weird, but we'll, we'll, we'll count for some points. As a photographer, he was hired by National Geographic to document a voyage across the uh, South Seas in a replica of Sinbad's boat. Uh, so he was a photographer and the boat got stuck in the doldrums. No wind for three weeks. They were just stuck. He had about two books with him, one of which was a book on computer programming. This is like 1983. I don't even know why he had a book on computer programming. So he read this book over and over again and he just had this moment of insight where it was like, but if you can tell a computer in like these kind of programming ways to do something, then that computer can do anything, can't it? And of course, being a very hands-on person, he was like, of course, I have to make it be able to touch things and move things and make things happen. So when he got back from that trip, he started building robots and he realized that he wanted to build a robot that could do everything for everybody. Um, so of course, as you can probably guess from the fact that we build robot hands, he started out by building a biped, legged robot. Um, his reasoning made some sense. It was that to get around a house, a home, anywhere, you need to be able to conquer stairs, you need to be able to step through narrow places, and nobody seemed to be doing bipeds. So he, he set off doing this and he gathered some kind of like-minded people, interested people around, uh, and this is again mid-1980s, early 1990s. We built one of the first bipeds that could stand up in the world. Um, it's now in the Science Museum, which is a, a, a nice achievement to have got to. Um, I got involved because I was a, a kid who liked programming computers and I ran into him at a computing camp and was like, this is excellent. I want to get involved in this. I want to write AI software for these robots that you're building. I still haven't got to write AI software for any of the robots that he was building. Uh, what I ended up doing was, was debugging robots. Uh, there's, a, there's a great saying from the... The, the, the founding of computing is like the first point where we knew what we were doing was when we realized that we were going to spend most of our time debugging the programs that we'd written. Writing a program is easy. Getting it to work is really hard. Debugging is mostly what you do in computing. And in robotics, the same is true, except you have mechanical engineering problems as well. So you're not just trying to get the algorithm to work. You're also trying to get the curvature of the knee to be the right shape so the sensor is actually monotonic. Uh, and I did at one point end up debugging a neural net system that wasn't converging with a hammer and chisel because I had to chip enough wood off the knees so the sensor was, was monotonic. Otherwise, the network couldn't learn on that robot. It's one of the nice things about robotics is it is a kind of uh, a field, a discipline that takes in almost everything. You can be a software person and do mostly software, but from time to time you will find yourself going, but I understand why this isn't working and it's because the motor torque isn't powerful enough. I have to understand that in order to understand why it's working or not working. Or I know why we can't do this. It's because actually there's too much leverage or not enough leverage or that sensor wears too quickly. Robotics is very much the point where you take computers and make them, I'll use the phrase intimate with the world. 
you know, when it when it really becomes embedded in the world and actually becomes intimate with it and makes things happen and makes things change. And that's always been kind of part of the fascination for me about it. When I grew up, you could write fascinating programs on computers, but no one could see what they did because this is kind of pre-internet, like doing stuff. You could draw a picture on a screen, but nobody could understand something creative that you've done in the computer unless they sat there and typed at it a lot with you. So getting machines to do something was a kind of an easy way to, to get that out. So why did we set up a company? I said it was a bit of a different journey. Richard, our kind of original founder, he'd never really wanted to set up a business around this. He just had a group of like-minded people and we did it as a hobby. We did it for fun. Uh, but we were doing a few things that interested people. And some of them came to us and said, this stuff you're doing is really interesting. I'd like to buy some of it. And we're like, oh, wow. OK, that's great. That's kind of flattering. Sure. Like, but you're going to have to have a company for me to buy it off because I can't send you a purchase order and an invoice, get an invoice without that. So we set up a company. This would be like 1997. Yeah. And carried on doing what we were doing, which was doing a few interesting things and just with a company. And we we had a look and what can you do with a company? Well, you can raise some money. But we were frankly had no business plan and no goal and no long term ambition and certainly no market segment identified. Well, we had a long term ambition, but it wasn't a commercial one. Our long term ambition was like build some interesting robots. That's not kind of a very commercial goal. Um, but we did manage to find that we could, because we were doing technology, we could get some money from the government to do technology development. And one of the nice things that we learned is that the government's always happy to put a bit of money into things that seem exciting and technology, provided it's like fits whatever their themes are at the moment. And over the years, we've done very well out of essentially going to governments and saying, hey, we do interesting technology stuff. We can see that this can make a difference in the future. Can you put some money in now to help us do that? And it's it's a different time scale approach to to getting funding from investors, but it doesn't dilute your equity, which if you are interested in growing something over the long term, not diluting your equity is very, very important. So we got a bit of funding from the government, a couple of grants, uh, different programs. One of them gave us some business training as well. We we built some stuff. We put some details of what we were doing up on our website, which at the time was kind of a pretty novel idea. Um, and a university phoned us up and said, hey, this thing that you built, I, I, we'd like to get one. Uh, and they ended up becoming our, our first big long term customer. Uh, so that's the University of Bielefeld in Germany. What we didn't realize at the time is that there's a long standing German joke that Bielefeld doesn't exist. I'm not sure where it comes from, but if you go to Wikipedia, there's a whole thing called the Bielefeld conspiracy, where just like all Germans know about this. And it's like Bielefeld doesn't really exist. OK, fine. Um, so whenever we got up at a conference and said, so uh, our customers at the University of Bielefeld, all the Germans in the room started laughing and we didn't know why for quite a long time. We kind of looked blank and said, Professor Helga Ritter, winner of this award. And oh, right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. OK, you're not in on the joke. Sorry. We thought you were making the Bielefeld joke. Anyway. Early customer, interesting to have, paid good money because the great thing about research academics is when they want something novel, they'll pay for it and they'll expect it to be weird and flaky and complicated and break a lot and they'll work with you to make it better. And that was kind of good because that got us a, a really nice line of people who were using our stuff to do interesting things. Um, at that point, we were building hands. And the reason we switched from bipeds to hands was uh, quite simple. Honda started building bipeds. Uh, and if you, again, see the Science Museum's robot exhibition, you'll see our biped next to Honda's first biped, um, which when they released that, they were, everyone in the world just kind of went, whoa, what the hell is that? That's amazing. Uh, and we all kind of went, why are we going to build a biped if they can do that? A few years later, we found that they'd built it out of their marketing budget. It wasn't an engineering project at all. It was just a look at how cool we are at Honda. Look at this amazing stuff we do. And they've never yet found a business model for their bipeds. So kind of glad I'm not in that business. But we switched over to building hands. And the rationale for building hands was a version of the same initial one. It was like, you need hands to do things. Everything in my environment is designed to be used by a hand. If I can't use it with one or two hands, it's like I probably got tools to do that. So maybe the robot should have those, those same sort of capabilities. So that gave us, we had a product, Robot Hands. We were selling them to, to people in universities, but we still weren't very bothered about doing the business side of it. Uh, we had various people wander in and out and kind of go, oh yeah, we can sell these things and we can make money and uh, fail spectacularly at it. And around about 2007, after the, the last round of person coming in and saying, yes, I'll help you make lots of money. And a year later being like, yep, thank you. Go, never come back, never talk to us again. Uh, we realized that we were, we were not taking seriously the business side of what we were doing 
and that we should do that because we couldn't do the technology side of it. No matter how passionate we were about building things and making things and doing things, we had to eat, we had to buy computers, we had to buy electronics, we had to buy motors, we had to pay rent. So while some of us were able to kind of live off this, that and the other, it, that wasn't concentrating on doing it and it wasn't sustainable and it wasn't it wasn't fair to everybody effectively um so rather than go and try and raise money we said well we know we can sell some things we know we can get r d funding what we need is somebody who actually knows about our organization and what we do and we'll get them to be good at doing the business stuff and uh, we had a, a meeting of the the kind of the the, the the leading people in the company and we kind of all looked at each other and went like that and when the finger pointing settled, all the fingers were pointing at me, um, which was not completely surprising, to be honest, because I was the person who'd been like, well, we can do more with this and this is how we can do it. And, and this is how we'll go about trying to sell something to somebody. And this is how we'll go about marketing or promoting or marketing that. One of the nice things about business stuff is most of it is pretty simple. It's just boring. Accountancy, simple but boring. Sales negotiation, simple, but mostly boring. Uh, commercial invoices, simple, boring. Export, complicated, mostly boring. Getting more complicated, mostly boring. And the, the thing about business as well is it's easy to learn. There are lots and lots and lots of books on it. And every successful business person appears to want to write some nice how-to books on how to do what they did. So if you're willing to plow through 20 or 30 books where somebody tells you how wonderful they are because of their early success by happening to find a market niche and exploiting it, you can learn a lot about it quite quickly. Technology is hard to learn. Computing, hard to learn. Robotics, hard to learn. You have to kind of really commit. You have to understand the facts are true or not. You can't argue with a compiler. No one has ever managed to persuade the laws of physics to change somewhat because they figure they should get a better deal this month off the laws of physics. You want to pay rent on a building, you can always negotiate with the landlord, but the laws of physics you, you can't argue with. So if you're interested in technology, you can pick up the business stuff later. If you're interested in business, learning the technology stuff is probably never going to happen. Uh, and one of the things we've seen over and over again is people coming along and being I've got a great idea for a technology product. All I need is a technical co-founder to help me make it. Watch out for those people because they're the people who are interested in starting a business, growing it and then selling it. And therefore their motivation for that business is for them to make as much money as possible. And that word of them does not include you necessarily. They'll be much more interested in what they get out of it than what everyone else gets out of it. We come from a slightly different perspective. We're in this because we enjoy building things. We enjoy making robots. We enjoy having fun making robots. We've learned how to how to sell those robots to people, how to turn the turn what we do into a business. And our business is about building the best robots we can for the people we work with. And frankly, having as good a time doing it as possible because we enjoy doing it and we, we want to do it, which does kind of help with our our motivation, our direction, it helps us understand what to do. It's like, well, we're in this for ourselves to do well doing this and having fun doing it. So what are we going to do? Let's spend the money on more interesting technology stuff because that's what we actually want. Um, I, said, I said I'd say a few things about robotics. And to be absolutely honest, I'm the least qualified person in the world to say anything about robotics. I have a degree in pure maths from Cambridge. Um, so I'm very, very qualified to tell you how to generate the numbers from nothing. Uh, I used to do it as a party trick to amuse people, the, the old set theory thing, or, or logic theory, where you do that. Um, mostly I use that degree as a big stick to beat people with. If you're having an argument with people and some people are saying, well, you know, I think this is true and I think this is true and I'm, I'm, I'm a law, Harvard law graduate. You're like, maths, Cambridge, I think you're both wrong and this is why. Let me draw your diagram and break out the thing. It does, does work quite well for that. And it is one of those things that a degree from Cambridge is a great trump card to keep in your back pocket and just use just occasionally when you want to slap someone down and say, no, 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 I, I think you'll find I have slightly more understanding of this than you do. Um, it's obviously a bit cheating to do that because it is arguing from authority, but it's always nice. It's nice to have the trick if you need it. So yeah, I don't know a lot about robotics. I know a lot about what's going on and where people are with it and what's happening and what's exciting. And I think we're in one of those great times where everything shifted and we're now realizing the benefits of that shift. So 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 
you could stand up at the start of a talk and say, how many cameras has everybody in the room got with them? And people might know how many cameras they had. You know, somebody might have actually brought a physical camera. Somebody would have a laptop that had, they, they knew their laptop had a camera on it. Somebody would have a phone with a camera on it. Now, if I pick up my phone, I think, so this is a generic recent Sony. I think there are one, two, three, four, five, six cameras on there, I think. But I'd have to go and read the spec sheet carefully to find out. And there's probably one thing that isn't obviously a camera, but was just implemented by using a camera chip anyway, because it was just easier to do that. Sensors got cheap. Sensors eventually became free. Computing became very, very cheap. Um, we can now put in a cheap piece of hardware a Raspberry Pi or something, more computing than the entire moon missions had, more computing than, in fact, one of my colleagues showed me a couple of days ago, he was at a space science conference and somebody got up with a 3D printed moon rover. So you can go online, download the plans, 3D print a moon rover, or Mars rover, sorry, put a Raspberry Pi in it, and it's got more computing power than the actual Mars rover they sent 10 years ago. The, the, these things are, are nice places to be in, in terms of the, the capability. We have really good open software frameworks. It's possible in ROS to knock up a robot really, really quickly, which means you can get on with doing the actual problem of getting the robot to really do something useful. Um, we have great manufacturing capabilities globally. We have good, we used to have good supply chains and all happened there. Um, we have the ability to work with people globally. So you no longer are kind of stuck with the confines of when I started doing robotics, it was the people I could find in the UK who I could actually go and meet, I could work with. We could send each other letters, we could post a disc in the post to one another, but actual physical collaboration required us to go and be in the same place together and make tea for each other, which wasn't a bad thing, but it was a kind of a critical requirement. And what we're now seeing is that it's easy to set up a it's relatively easy to set up a, a team doing something exciting in robotics. It's relatively easy to get to the point where you've got some basic vision working, you've got mobility working, you've got navigation working. So getting a, building another autonomous mobile robot that wanders around a factory and picks things up and brings things back from people is kind of like, yeah, that's easy. Leave that to people at Imperial. That's the kind of thing they can do. But actually solving a really interesting problem with a robot. So one of the most interesting problems I've seen solved with robots the last few years was the, the the team out of Edinburgh, Harriet Watt, who built a robot to reduce predators on coral reefs. Uh, there's a type of fish that's responsible for eating, for destroying coral reefs. So they work with a bunch of um, oceanographic engineers and marine biologists and they said, well, we can build an underwater robot like this that will attack that predator and nothing else. And it will have like a finite life because we're back to blah, blah, blah. But one robot should be able to remove this many predators. Um, and then they did a crowdfunder to buy as many of them as possible and basically drop them in to see to, if they could reduce the population of the predators and save the colony. I don't know if that worked or not. I forgot to follow up on it. But when I saw it, I was just like, what an absolutely brilliant idea. Take a, a climate change evolutionary problem and say, let's crowdfund some robots to solve that problem. Totally different solution, a totally different area. Um, and what gets really interesting now is going and using robotics in different departments. So what can a robot do in climate science? What can a robot do in marine biology? What can a robot do in archeology? span I've seen examples of robots doing interesting or robotic technology being used by robot people who went and talked to people in those fields and said, oh, what are your problems? Oh, okay, you want to traverse this piece of marsh and measure the gas coming off the marsh. Wow, that sounds like a real challenge. Yeah, it is, you get stuck in the marsh, you disturb it. It's like pristine bogland, you don't really wanna do that. You can't stay there for a long time because you sink into it. All right, what if we ran a robot on a line over there and the robot moved along and dropped a cup, sucked all the air out of the cup, picked the cup up, moved along, dropped a cup, sucked all the air. University of York are doing this in their climate uh, soil science department now. They've got a bunch of people, they built some robots, they're exporting these all over the world as a piece of robot technology that soil scientists are using to study marsh in a way they couldn't do before. Quite a fantastic idea. Would I ever have thought of it? Of course I wouldn't because I don't talk to soil scientists. So 
I think there are a huge number of really interesting problems that we can take robot technology and apply it to. And it's got so much easier to do it that I think now is a great time to do it. And the, the opportunity is there. As you know, you don't have to do an, a degree in robotic engineering to build a robot. You can do a degree in robotic engineering and there are huge fat textbooks on robotics you can go away and learn all the equations for and you can understand the, how to do the, you know. or of course you could just use the ROS packages that wrap all that up and know just about enough in that to know that, yeah, that package works. If I really need to debug it, I can, but I probably don't because it was done by people who actually knew how to get that to work. What I'm gonna do is get all these bits to work and then go and do that thing over there. And if the robot breaks down, I'm back to debugging. And that was always why we came in to do this in the first place. So those were a few initial words from me. They perhaps weren't so much about robotics as about what you can do about robotics. Uh, and if anybody's got any, any questions, any queries, or want me to expand on that or, I didn't talk about something you wanted me to talk about. Feel free to, to shoot away. Yeah, so thanks so much, Rich, for uh, giving us those words. Um, if, you, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to either raise your hand or throw them in chat. And then um, we'll let you know to unmute yourself and turn on your video and whatnot to ask them. Um, I just have a first initial question. So you've talked a lot about um, the impact of robotics in like the research sector. You could talk about your research clients um, yep. you, and also just these theoretical uh, imp like implications of robotics. I was wondering what your thoughts are on the impact of robotics in the commercial sector uh, going forward. So every, there's a, there's a set of graphs on how much people use industrial robots globally and how many robots each country has and what uptake they are. And there's a lot of people get very, very concerned about those and really, you know, there's a robot gap and Britain only has this many industrial robots per. And I, I think these are really, really important problems. And I think that the Institute for Manufacturing will talk to you about them all day. And to be absolutely honest, I realized a long time ago that manufacturing is awesome and very boring. And if you like it and you're excited by it, it's really awesome. Uh, but every time we went and looked at manufacturing problems, we kind of spent like a while talking to people in there. And we just kind of went, you know what? This is this problem is going to be solved by someone who makes a machine that does the same thing 100,000 times a day, exactly the same thing. And they're going to optimize for cents on the dollar. And I can't even be bothered. <laughs> <laughs> I've, ne I've never been that motivated by, by that part of it. Um, genuinely and seriously, there are lots of fascinating problems in manufacturing. There are lots of areas where they're tackling the simultaneous problem of uh, being, being able to get enough people to do the job because people don't want to go and do working, work in manufacturing, being able to do highly skilled precision tasks at scale and being able to be incredibly flexible. Um, there's a long-term goal, people, manufacturing people keep coming up to, which is batch size one. You know, every product is different from every other product. Uh, and there are some absolutely fascinating questions and challenges around. So how do you assemble something if everything that you assemble is going to be a bit different? Uh, and if you look at companies like uh, Arrival, for example, or Tesla even, what they've done is they've said, OK, we're going into a manufacturing heavy industry. And the first thing we're going to do is to do our manufacturing differently, because we think that will give us a unique advantage over, over how our product is, is done. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I'm not the right person to talk about robotics in manufacturing. Yeah, I guess I guess going off of that a little bit um, is like, do you see um, robotics impacting the lives of like typical laymen and um, like typical men and women around the world in general beyond just like the field of manufacturing? So maybe like the impact of robotics in their households or whatnot. Yeah. So a friend of mine likes to point out that the modern dishwasher is a robot in everything except for the fact that it doesn't move. If a dishwasher moves, you've got problems. Um, but it senses its environment, it monitors its environment, it changes its environment. Um, so it'll add salt or something, it'll, uh, it'll manage the wash flow depending on the amount of dirt coming out, it'll vary the program, it responds to that, it, it performs a task for you, there's a range of tasks it can do. It's, it's moderately intelligent. We don't think of a dishwasher as a robot because, you know, it, it's clearly it's we think of robots as something else. Um, so in terms of what are we going to see around our homes that is robot technology that will influence and impact on us? Vacuum cleaners, we've already seen. Um, if you've talked to anybody who's been at Dyson for a long time, 
they'll tell you, they should tell you the story about how the handheld Dyson vacuum cleaner, the portable one, got invented. Dyson's robotics team built it because they needed to make a battery powered vacuum cleaner that they could drive around the room. And then they were using this to test their vacuum cleaning. Like the, how, how do we navigate around a house and clean? That was the problem they were trying to solve. Uh, and somebody walked in and said, what's that on the floor over there? And they said, oh, it, it's our robot vacuum cleaner. And they picked it up and they said, wait, battery, motor, cyclone, nozzle. This is a handheld vacuum cleaner. We don't have a handheld vacuum cleaner. And they went, we do now. Because by doing the robotics, they'd accidentally created the handheld vacuum cleaner. And as a result, uh, apparently James Dyson stopped trying to sack his robotics team every six months. He's apparently notoriously prone to sacking people randomly. They got a lot of air cover from that. Um, are we going to see it? I think last mile delivery, logistics, there's going to be some changes around that. Self-driving vehicles, hopefully we will see something in that. I look forward to self-driving vehicles. Um, I have a long-term bet with myself about that. I've never learned to drive. I expect to buy a car, but I'm not going to learn to drive to do it, right? So yeah. it's, it's a long-term bet. I'm 30 years down it and I still haven't seen a, a likely version of it, but you know, it keeps me amused if nothing else. It keeps taxi drivers very amused. That's, uh... But in the home, if we see healthcare changes, I think that can be interesting. So at the moment, care delivery is, oh, Social care delivery is by people turning up at your house or you going somewhere. Secondary care, you go somewhere. Primary care, you have to be somewhere. So when we get better robot technology, will we see social care being delivered through robots? We've looked at this from an engineering point of view in the past, and it was difficult to get the price right. Um, the cost of delivering social care is 10 to 30 pounds an hour. A robot in the home that's functional and versatile on a 10 to 30 pound an hour budget is somewhat limited. Um, so that, that can often be the, 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 the point that these things change is like, can you change the economics of it? COVID has changed the economics of a lot of things. It's not possible to deliver social care at the moment without significant risk. Does that mean we'll see care robots? Quite possibly we'll see some things being used in, in that space. Yeah. So much. Uh, that was really interesting. So we have a couple of questions. Um, one from Harry. Harry, if you'd like to uh, unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Hello. Can you see me? Hi. Yep. Cool. Um, I'm aware that my question's not necessarily fitting the talk because it's been more about how we can use robots and stuff. But I was working on a project and I was wondering if you could help. Um, with a robotic hand, how would it be able to tell the difference between, say, an egg and a brick? Mm -hmm. So be, being able to lift an egg without crushing it, yet still being able to apply enough force to the brick? Or is that something which is pre-programmed generally? Yeah. Okay, so I come from the, 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 the do it fast and do it right school of engineering. So the way you do that fast is you cheat brutally. The difference between an egg and a brick is size and surface friction. But if I can get my fingers wrapped round either of them, I don't have to squeeze it. So a robot with long enough fingers can pick anything up that it can make a cage out of and wrap it round. Mm -hmm. And there's an actual extension of that as a thing called a force closure grasp, which is where you calculate how you're applying the forces from the contact points to the, sh the surface of the object that you've detected by the fact that you're contacting it. And those forces, if they, if they do the equivalent of being a cage around the object, then you have got hold of the object. Um, if you know the size of the object, it's easy because you simply move until you're touching the object and then apply sufficient force that your friction will cope with the weight. If you can't cope, if you can't tell what the weight of the object is, then you need slip sensing on, on the fingers of the robot so you can feel that it's not grasping it. Um, obviously, eggs are surprisingly strong. They don't do very well under puncturing but actually squeezing eggs, you have to squeeze harder than you think to pick them up. Uh, bricks obviously are very, very strong in that respect. But a grasp that will pick something up, basically in my mind looks like a grasp that closes to onto the, onto the thing and then a little bit more. So if you know the object, close to where the object is 
and then close a little bit further and keep an eye on the amount of force that your motors are generating or torque that your motors are generating, which okay. will be the current in them. So that will give you an idea of how much you're squeezing it. But then if you don't know the weight of the thing, yeah. the only way to make sure that you keep hold of it is with a closure, with something that will measure that in some way. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much for that, Harry. Um, we have another question here from Kai. Yeah. So Kai, if you'd like to, uh, yeah, uh, Hello? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Also hear me? Okay, cool. Uh, so um, I wanted to ask a question uh, about uh, recent coverage with OpenAI. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of like publicity with OpenAI and it's like uh, a reinforcement learning algorithm. Did anything change in the company after that uh, about products or strategy or whatever, basically? Uh, yeah. So they paid us good money to make our hardware better which was nice. Um, we've, we've always been a company that's grown through, like we, I said we hadn't taken investment. Uh, well, I think I sort of alluded to that. We've grown through two steps. The first is finding non-diluting funding, so grant funding to, to do R&D effectively and to, to develop stuff. Uh, and the second is having customers pay for stuff. And the great thing about customers paying for stuff is it keeps you very honest because if they don't like it, they're not going to pay you for it. So with OpenAI, they came to us and they said, we want to use your hands for our reinforcement learning stuff. And we said, oh, yeah, OK, that's fine. This is the kind of hand that we do. So they, they bought a hand and they came back a while later and said, it's broken. And we said, really? What have you done? And they showed us what they've been doing. And we were like, OK, not designed for that, not designed for that. Because what reinforcement learning algorithms do when they learn to use fingers is this kind of thing. They, they, they're not quite doing random motor babbling, but it's damn close to that. And the, the contacts and impacts and forces were just not what the hardware was designed for at all. So they were wearing it out and they were breaking it really, really quickly. And we said, well, this is clearly out of spec. This is like, it's unreasonable to expect our robot hand to survive doing this. Uh, so they said, well, okay, how can we get it to survive doing that? So we actually did an engineering program with them where over about six months, we increased the reliability of our hardware on their problem by a factor of 100, uh, which was pretty substantial. So they went from being able to break it in, in one to three hours to not being able to break it for 100 to 200 hours, uh, which is a significant improvement. And that flowed through into a, a kind of a fundamental set of design changes in the hardware. But weirdly, that didn't really affect anything else particularly. What they're doing is um, big and complicated and somewhat inaccessible to people like me. Like I, I can just about understand what they're doing when I, I read the, the, the absolute beginner's guide to what the hell we just did press releases. Uh, but if you ask me like, what does GPT-2 do, do inside or GPT-3? I'm like, yeah, I don't really know. And I'm not really, it's like, beyond me so we haven't actually used any of the stuff they're doing it's like it's a set of nice things they're doing what has been most well sorry that's not true we have used a lot of the things they're doing we've used their marketing material because a great customer is one who doesn't just give you money for your product they then go on to tell other people how wonderful your product is and show them how wonderful your product is so that you can then go hey did you see that stuff that those people over there did it's great that do you want to do some stuff like that thank you very much Here's some things you can do that with. I fully expect at some point the set of things that they have done will turn into technology I can use and apply, but I'm, I don't need it at the moment for the set of problems I'm trying to solve. Most of those come around there, the bucket of teleoperation and telepresence. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. So again, just a reminder to everybody, please don't be afraid to ask any questions that you have. Um, just throw them in chat or raise your hand. Jay, I think you have one, so. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that in, your, in the past, the robotic scene was pretty much non-existent. Hmm. So back then, was there even like, hmm, who did you look up to in those days when there weren't many good um, uh, big robotics? 
Who's I look do up to? Do you have a role model or someone that inspired you to do this kind of work? That's a good, a really good question. I'm trying to just trying to think well, what 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 got me to want to do this. I guess partly it came out of just becoming fascinated with with computers at an early age, um, and then like what can I do with computers and you know, what what does this mean and where can I go and what can I make with that. Um, and there there are various people in computing who who you, you kind of consider very very influential. Um, in some sense, I don't know whether anybody would ever think of Donald Knuth as a role model. Um, I'm not even sure he'd qualify as one. I'm not even sure he'd think it seems like that or thought like that. I know some very clever, I met some very clever people. Um, but again, they've never kind of seemed, I don't know. But it's just me, I don't, I've never kind of tended to think of people in that way. What I have found, though, is that it's very, very useful to talk to people who have done things like you've done in the past because people love telling their, their version of war stories oh yes i remember this time when we did that and if you've got people who have experience and you say hey i'm thinking about doing these things now they'll go oh i remember when we did something like that and what they did won't be anything like what you're doing but you can learn a lot from that so this is one of the reasons i read a lot of business books it's not because they necessarily are, are well written or full of good quality factual information but just sometimes you pattern match on them and you go that problem that they solved there is similar to that problem that i've seen for what we're doing or later on you think oh i remember somebody explaining that and here's a good one if you're ever doing business with people who want to pay you on in arrears they want you to deliver the product and they'll pay you 30 days 60 days 90 days later you say okay that's fine I, I totally understand that's your those are your, your terms of doing business um by the way we offer a four percent discount for 50 percent up front and we offer an eight percent discount for 100 percent up front and they will get really confused and they'll probably give you the money up front because it's almost impossible for them to get a four percent or an eight percent discount on a product in their line of work because they used to buying it we're going to pay you know we, we've been through the negotiations now we're just talking about the terms of delivery and you offer them a massive discount effectively uh, just for having the money earlier and suddenly they go from well we can't possibly pay you until 90 days after delivery to well, here, take my money take my money hopefully that will stick in your mind and you'll be able to use that later so i would say yeah, find some other people who do interesting things and talk to them sit and have lunch with them drink beers with them whatever just have a have a coffee and let them tell you about things that they do and tell them about things that you think are problems for the moment and see what they say and some of them will turn out to be interesting and informative and, and helpful and some of them will be complete bullshit artists but that's okay as long as you didn't put them on your board of directors you don't have to talk to them again do you have any tips on how to network and find people like these uh LinkedIn, cold call on LinkedIn. I mean, basically a, a second degree email through on LinkedIn. Basically, is going, "Hi, I see you know so and so. You know so and so. I know so and so. I'm interested in talking to you about X. Could you spare the time for a coffee if to have a chat about X?" Some people, a lot of people, will give you the time for like a 30 minute conversation just to chat about X, especially since they've been stuck at home, bored out of their minds the last eight months. Um, I gave a talk that last month in Edinburgh, or at Edinburgh. Uh, and I've had like a couple of chats since then with the PhD students going, can I pick your brains about how the hell I can try and do whatever it is I'm trying to do with the thing that I'm trying to do? And those conversations go nothing near the technology of it in the end. They go through all kinds of other things. So people will tend to reach out like that. And I think a lot of people in business kind of understand the principle that you you became successful by other people helping you in various ways, mentoring, guiding, paying that forward is all you can do with that. Um, yeah. So, and if you find helpful people, yeah, appreciate them that they're, they're there and pay it forward yourself. And the other thing is, I was once given the advice: if you've got a, a business plan and you think it's a good plan, find the three cleverest people you know, buy them a coffee each, and tell them the plan each, and let them pick it apart in front of you. Which they'll take great pleasure in doing because they're clever people, and clever people will always do that. When they finish picking it apart, take notes. Don't argue with them. There's no point doing that. Just, just you know, note the things they picked apart. Ask each of them for three more clever people. Go home, 
cry, edit the plan, go back, try it on the next lot of people you got. And if you do that, down to like 81 people, you will have had your plan picked apart by a huge number of really clever people for the cost of a lot of coffee and a lot of sitting there going, oh, for fuck's sake, yes, yes, he's absolutely right. Or this, this person's a total idiot. This person's an absolute idiot. Why am I listening to them? Why am I listening to them? Thank you very much. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Yes, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. I mean, you're at a university that's full of very clever people, some of whom will have done amazing things outside their career at university, some of whom will have done amazing things inside their career at university. If you if you want to understand about something, finding the people in your college who are in their 50s and 60s and have done something vaguely similar to it in the past might well stand you in great stead. I don't know how many people have ever gone and asked the bursar in their college for advice on the financial section of a business plan. Uh, I think thanks so much for that. Um, yeah. This is a bit of a wonder. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for that. Um, Paul, I think you have another question. So, Paul, if you'd like to unmute and... Yeah, so my question is, um, what changes do you reckon um, soft robotics will, will bring to uh, the whole field? Um, what kind of time do you think as well um, those changes would, would come to force? So I love the fact that it's now got a name because when we were first building robots in the 1980s and 1990s, we were using compliant pneumatic actuators that were springy uh, and therefore everything that we built was inherently soft in some way, shape or form, but there wasn't a word for it. Uh, I can't remember whether, when the word turned up as such a thing. I think it was the point when 3D printing got good enough that you could actually print something that was an act, would act self-actuate by putting air into it or something. Um, but there's obviously a bunch of stuff around the the variable stiffness actuators that uh, uh, Jill Pratt and co did and various other things like that, where essentially you could kind of turn this around and say, when control theory got complicated enough that you could combine a motor and a spring and a sensor and generate a control algorithm that worked on it, certain things changed but then when material science got good enough that you could 3d print things with varying density also certain things changed um and yeah i think what's happened any anything like that so if you study the history of technology you'll see that what happens is from time to time something gets named and it gets named and it goes on for a while as being the thing and when you actually look at the history around it, you find that it carried on for a long time before that. And it carried on for a long time after that. Just for a brief period, it had a marketing label because it was quite sexy. Steam engines, a classic example of that. Um, soft robotics is a term. It's a great marketing label. It makes it easy to find the papers. It makes it easy to know where to send you, how to write your conference proceedings or whatever. Um, but actually, compliant robots have been around for a very long time. Those are soft robots. Uh, robots built out of unusual materials have been around for a very long time. Robots that are, that are combi where you combine the actuator and the sensor has kind of also been around for a while. Being able to do all of them in the same thing, like it may just be that we're looking at what did 3D printing do for robotics? Oh, soft robots. Um, so that's not really an answer, but I think it's more a case of like, this is a, a topic that cross cuts across lots and lots of bits of the robotics field in the same way that robotics cross cuts across lots of other fields uh, and it will have various various changes and impacts there. Now, if you're talking about collaborative robots, in other words, the ability to put a robot next to a human without a safety fence, that's already made a massive difference. And it's changing the way that everybody in industry, manufacturing and in service areas thinks about robots because with a collaborative robot, it's suddenly really easy to have a robot working with a person. And 20 years ago, it was unimaginable to have a robot working with a person. So I would say that more than anything else is the, the sea change. Yeah. Thanks so much for that question, Paul. Um, and thanks so much for the answer, Richard. We have another question from Ben. So, and if you'd like to unmute yourself. Hi. Um, Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, so do you have any plans to like, um, open source any of your hardware or technology or, or perhaps like a, like an older version of it. Um, and like, what are your opinions on open source hardware basically? I like the idea of open source hardware, but I don't make money out of open source hardware. I mean, I, I make money out of making very complicated mechanical objects and selling them to people. Uh, we have in the past looked at 
open sourcing some of the things that we did and we realized that actually unless you give away the entire design you, a piece of giving away a piece of it is is like my electronics driver boards are basically completely useless to anybody who doesn't build exactly the same motor assembly as me in the same packing constraints as me. So I can't really, I could open source it, but it wouldn't be any use to you. Um, if I want to, if I want to solve a problem, that's a really hard problem, open sourcing the hardware that you need in order to address that problem sounds like a really good idea. So I mentioned the, uh, the, the uh, robot predator for reef management. There's actually an even better example of that. There's a robot called Argos, which was developed by oceanographic engineers over, let me think, probably 20 years, last, over the last 20 years. And Argos is an open source buoy. So it's an instrument buoy, which means it's a metal cylinder about two meters tall. You throw it in the ocean and it can sink and it can rise. That's its actuation strategy. It has data collection sensors on it, lots of them, and it has a transmission beacon and a GPS on it. So basically over the last 20 years, oceanographic scientists all over the world have taken one standard design of Argus Boy. They iterate it every few years as the hardware gets better and the capabilities get better. And they build these things and they throw them in the ocean. And they bobble off around the world and they if you look at the map of where they are, they're pretty much everywhere now. But that means that 20 years ago, oceanographic science consisted of occasionally somebody would tow a probe through a bit of sea. Hugely expensive to do, really expensive boat. Now they just throw a few hundred more boys in and let them drift around places. And they've even got methods because you can control the buoyancy and hence the height, you can actually steer them. So drop down, hit that current, go over there, come back up again. So you can get them dispersed around to where you want them and need them. And that's a really nice example of, of a place where the problem is we want to go and observe those things over there. Observing them is really, really expensive. A robot can do it. Great, let's make that robot and then open source it because we don't care about the robot. We're not trying to make money out of the robot. We care about going and doing the observation. The robot is a, is a component, a tool for doing that. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Is that right? It's just, uh, so we have probably enough time for about two more questions. So Kai, if you'd like to mute yourself again. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. All right. So my question is about uh, different kinds of robot hands. So the shadow robot hand is very complicated. It has a lot of degrees of freedom, like an anthropomorphic hand. Yep. But there is a lot of robotic hands which are pincer grippers or three fingers or yeah. really simple to understand. But by the simplicity, you gain more fundamental understanding of the physics and how it's controlled and stuff like this. Um, what do you think about this kind of gradient between anthropomorphic, really complicated hands versus, you know, simple hands that you can probably control better and understand better? Mm. It's funny. The, have you seen the Festo fin gripper? Yes, yes. I think so so yeah. for, the, for those of you who haven't, Festo, and there's a chair that uses the same principle as this. Festo looked at the way a shark's fin works. And uh, the, basically they came up with this design and I can't remember the details of it precisely, but essentially it's a roughly triangular, bit sail shaped thing with lots of horizontal bars. And it deforms in a really interesting way when you push it from the side, which is why it makes a great chair back. And it also makes a really good gripper because you bend it into something and it deforms around the thing in a really nice way. And it's a really, really visually simple mechanical structure. And the mathematics of it is just unbelievably complicated. It's an absolute nightmare to simulate or model. It's like hugely, hugely complicated because effectively it's, it's doing um, embodied intelligence. The, the intelligence in the complexity, the sheer complexity of the design and the interaction with the world causes it to do something really powerful. I actually think our fingers are simpler than that. Um, they have fewer movements, fewer degrees of freedom. Uh, but I think there's, yeah, going back to what I said earlier about industrial automation, if you want to pick something up a million times, and you know what it is, there's absolutely no point using a humanoid robot hand to do it. You should use a two or three jaw gripper that will apply the right force and close the right amount at the right speed. And there's lots of companies that make that. And if you're interested in that, have a look. Uh, there's a company called Shunk, 
who are a fantastic example of a, an incredibly good company you've never heard of unless you happen to be in their niche. If you're in the industrial automation grasping and gripping space, you've heard of Shunk, German family owned company. They've been growing at 5% per year for the last 60 years. And they will probably they will continue to do so indefinitely. That's kind of what they do. They make grippers and they're excellent at it. They don't really do computer software at all. They're mechanical engineers. So when they try and build something with multiple degrees of freedom, they get really confused by it and they can't even tell you how to like they they, they don't really have very good APIs and they certainly don't understand if you want to open a TCP IP socket to it and squirt some stuff over from San Francisco. So we kind of come in at the other end of the space and we say, well. We built a fully humanoid robot hand because we felt robots would need those to do some set of things. Sure, there's lots of things you can do without them, but when it comes down to it, if you want to do everything, you're going to need to have a humanoid robot hand. Uh, it, it's a nice space. There's plenty of segments in it. There's lots of kind of classic marketing segmentation diagrams you can draw where you do capability and payload. But what we just said was like, we want to be up in there in that top right hand corner as dexterous as possible because that's an interesting place to be. And no one else gets there. We're kind of, we're not unique in that sense. But when you think of dexterous robot hands, people start to think of us first. And being the people who do one thing incredibly well is a really good way to get people turning up at your door and asking you to do something. If you do two or three things well, you might well do well. But if you do one thing insanely well, then you will be the people that everyone knows. You go there for that. Those are the people who do that. Uh, and as a differentiating strategy as a business, being incredibly good at one thing is a differentiating strategy that's hard to beat. And the question about passive joints. Um, so actually the hand that Shadow build, these fingers, the first, second, third, and fourth finger, all have a passive joint in them. The coupling between this joint and this joint is implemented passively. In the human finger, it's also relatively passive. It's not completely passive, but it's very rare that anybody can control that joint in isolation. Uh, typically climbers and piano players can do that and most of the rest of us can't. It's apparently you can learn to do it but you have to do something really quite weird with the, because of the way the tendons work to get that to happen. So we didn't bother implementing that on the shadow hand. It just that joint and that joint are coupled, they move together and, and that works for us. On the thumb we implemented slightly more movements. Um, and if you underactuate the hand or underactuate a robot, it's a great way to save on motors. But it probably means you need to put some more sensors in to understand what's happening. Because when you don't really know where the finger is, uh, some things become hard. It is possible to, again, to do the kind of soft robotics, compliant, underactuated robotics thing and, and exploit the environment to do that. And if you look at the RBO hand from the uh, Technical University of Berlin, uh, Oliver Brock's group, they did some really interesting things with very squidgy, underactuated robot hands that would grasp things by using the fact that if the hand pressed down on a surface, it would deform. So they could actually exploit the deformation to do the grasping, which is kind of cool. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much for that. that. Quite yeah. answers the question. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for that, Jacob. I think that's pretty much all we have time for. If somebody has one more question, we can probably take that. But otherwise, um, thanks so much for that, Rich. That was really interesting about your insights. Well, so anybody hasn't asked a question yet who'd like to ask one? Just Yeah. Uh, can I ask something? Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, what kind of skills do you think, um, I don't know, as if someone's interested in robotics, what, what do you think is the most important skill that we should have? Uh, learning and persistence as in being able to learn new things and being persistent and keeping doing things um, debugging is hard so you're going to have to keep doing it building things is difficult finding a problem that's worth solving is really really difficult so you you need to feel that you want to persist in doing that if you kind of wonder like oh this looks interesting when I mean, you get bored and wander off if you're if you're a genius of the level of Richard Feynman, you'll probably do some great work in the time that you're interested in robotics. But for most of us, the, the, the kind of key thing is, like, okay, it's not any particular skill you have. It's knowing that you're going to have to keep learning stuff and knowing that it's going to take a while to get something to happen because you have to do all these bits and bits of it. So just being willing to persist on it. Um, those are I'd probably say the, the two key things. Thank you. 
Thanks so much for that, Peter. Uh, I think that's pretty much all we have time for. So thanks so much, Rich, for sharing your experiences and uh, thanks, giving everyone. us a little bit more insight into the uh, world uh, of robotics. On yeah. the networking question, tag me on LinkedIn. And then if you find someone as a secondary contact of mine that you want to talk to, or you want to grab me at some point and just go, can, can I talk about this idea with you? Do reach out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thanks so much for that. Um, if you'd like to, so again, this is kind of a plug, but if you'd like to uh, see more of these fireside talks, um, please join our newsletter um, if you aren't already. I assume that pretty much all of you are already part of our newsletter. Um, also, there is a fireside chat uh, feedback form um, that I will get the, that I will send around in the chat just right now. So if you could fill that in. Um, if you could fill that in, that'd be very helpful to see what kind of speakers you'd like to see in the future and what kind of um, what, what we can improve on in these events. Um, thanks so much for joining us, Rich. Thank you. All right. Uh, I've clicked the fireside chat feedback form link now, so that's filled my screen. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to fill it out if you'd like as well. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, uh, everyone. Thank you. Bye.